All right, folks, we're back. And we were talking about phase changes in our previous video. And the phase change we were talking about at the very end was that of evaporation. And we said uh, there are two criteria that must be met in order for a molecule to be able to evaporate. The first one we said is it has to be on the surface of the liquid and that it has to have enough kinetic energy to break the intermolecular forces of attraction between the neighboring molecules. Now, if you remember, we said earlier that the average kinetic energies of all molecules is constant, but in actual fact, the individual kinetic energies vary greatly. And I hope I can make some sense of that for you at the beginning of this video today. Um, I guess the best example I could give is maybe a, a test average. Let's say for the past three years, the average exam score uh, for the exam we just took was an 80%. Okay, And that average is constant. Every year, the class average is 80%. Does that mean every individual scored 80%? Of course it doesn't. Some scored much higher than 80%. Some scored a lot lower, unfortunately, than 80%. In fact, maybe in this entire class, nobody actually scored the average. They were either all higher or all lower, but the average stayed constant at 80% year after year after year. Now, let's try to relate that to molecules in a liquid. The average kinetic energy at a given temperature for all molecules is constant. Does that mean that they all have the same kinetic energy? Do individual molecules have the same kinetic energy? No. Take a look at this graph. The y-axis is the number of molecules with that energy, and the x-axis is the actual kinetic energy. Do you see these guys way over here to the right? Those are the number of molecules that have enough energy to escape the attractive forces of their neighbors. Now, does that mean they're going to evaporate? No, it doesn't. Where do they have to be in order to evaporate? That's right, they need to be on the surface. So, how, when I have a droplet of water, so here's a desktop, kiddos, if I have a droplet of water, we know that that droplet of water will eventually evaporate. That means, at one point in time, every molecule has enough energy needed to evaporate, and every molecule eventually will be on the surface. So, which molecules will evaporate first? Well, not just because they're on the surface, remember. If they have enough kinetic energy, they will, won't they? So that molecule right there has just left and gone into the gas phase. Hasn't a molecule beneath it now been able to take its place? That's right. Now, it might not have enough kinetic energy. Where does it get that kinetic energy from? Well, it's an endothermic process, remember, and it can get that energy from the surroundings. So that molecule will eventually that's now on the surface will eventually have enough energy to evaporate and another molecule will take its place. So these molecules on the surface are constantly evaporating and as they, um, as they come to the surface, they can acquire the necessary kinetic energy from their surroundings to be able to leave their neighboring molecules and turn into a gas. I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you. So, only a certain number of molecules have enough energy to escape the attractive forces of their neighboring molecules and eventually evaporate. Yet, a drop of water will completely evaporate if left undisturbed on the tabletop. How do these other molecules acquire the needed energy? So that was that question we just answered. How do they acquire the needed energy? In other words, where does that energy come from? That's right, it comes from the surroundings. Think about, kiddos, when you get out of a swimming pool and a, on a very, very hot, hot, hot summer day. It's surprising, even though it might be 100 degrees outside, you get out of that pool and you start to shiver, don't you? Yeah, you do. Why are you shivering? Well, you are actually the surroundings for the water, part of the surroundings, that's, that's sitting on the top of your body. So as the high-energy molecules leave, the lower energy molecules will eventually leave once they get energy from their surroundings and they get that energy from your body. Your body gives off that energy to them and when your body loses that energy, it cools off. Now, of course, you start to heat up again when? 
That's right. After you've dried off, after all those molecules are either wiped off or you dry off, then you start warming up again because your body's no longer losing energy, uh, causing those molecules to evaporate. So it's possible for gaseous particles that have evaporated to again collide with the surface of the liquid it just left. If its kinetic energy is low enough, the particle may again become part of the liquid. However, if it comes from a container that is open, there's little chance of that happening. So when a water droplet starts evaporating from the surface of your body, those molecules that evaporate are rarely going to return back to the surface of the liquid and condense again. Now, if it's a very, very humid day, other molecules might be returning to the surface and condensing, but it's not likely. However, what if we have a closed container? The chance of this type of collision actually increases. In fact, a point is reached where just as many molecules of a gas return as leave the surface of the liquid. So in a closed container, the rate at which a molecule or molecules evaporate will equal the rate at which molecules condense. Or in other words, my liquid is forming a gas as quickly as my gas molecules are returning back to the liquid phase. Here, let's take a look at this picture, see if we can make sense of this. So, we have molecules leaving the surface, right? And they're becoming gas particles, right? Now, this is an open container, so some of them are, are leaving. Those that leave are probably not going to find their way back into the flask and have the opportunity to condense. So eventually the water level in this container will get lower and lower and lower and lower and lower until all the water molecules have evaporated and left the container. Now, what if I have a closed container? Yeah, I think you understand this now, don't you? See, these water molecules can't leave. They're forced to stay in that container. So initially, this water level might lower a little bit but I'm going to reach a point where the number of water molecules that leave the surface end up equaling the number of molecules that return back to the surface of the liquid. So that water level will be unchanged. Think of an unopened bottle of soda pop. That soda pop can sit around for years and the water level or liquid level doesn't change because it's closed. So these water molecules in here are bouncing around, hitting the walls of the container, and they're causing some pressure. And we call that pressure the vapor pressure of the liquid. All right? Now, in this particular system, over here, we say it is an equilibrium condition. Now, we're going to talk a lot about this later in the year. It's a special kind of equilibrium called dynamic equilibrium. So I'm just going to introduce that to you now, but it becomes a, becomes a big topic of our discussion later on. Let me state something called Le Chatier's Principle. Le Chatier's Principle states that when a system, excuse me, when a stress is placed upon a system, at equilibrium, the system will shift in a direction to relieve the stress. So when I place a stress on the system that's at equilibrium, the system will shift in a direction to relieve that stress. Um, let me give you a sort of a silly example. Let's say we have, we'll have our little girl again. I think we've used her earlier in the year. Okay. All right, and it's really, really cold outside. So she has a big coat on, okay? She has big old furry boots on to keep her feet warm. She has mittens on, 
and she has a hat on. Alrighty, she's really, really cold outside. So she comes inside. All right, so she walks in the door. And here she is inside. Now inside the house is a fireplace. Does that look like a fireplace to you? All right, immediately, where's that young lady gonna go? Yeah, the stress is she's cold. How does she relieve that stress? Well, she's going to walk towards the fireplace. So she ends up being over here, doesn't she? Nice and close to the fireplace with her big coat on, her cute little hat, her mittens, and her big furry boots, right? All right. Now, she's going to reach a point when she's inside that home with all of these clothes on and so close to the fireplace that a new stress is going to be introduced. Now she's sort of kind of warm, isn't she? That's the stress. What's she going to do to relieve that stress? Well, instead of shifting towards the fireplace, she's going to shift away from the fireplace to relieve that stress. And then she could probably take off her coat and her gloves and her furry boots and her hat. She's going to find a position where she is not under stress, either being too hot or too cold. That's sort of an example of Le Chatier's principle that involves a person. But let's see if we can illustrate Le Chatier's principle with this container up here um, of a liquid at equilibrium. So let's take a look at my water equilibrium. So what will happen to this happy equilibrium here if we heat it? So we have water in the liquid phase to water in the gas phase. Now the symbol for heat we're going to use is delta H. That's kind of like the fireplace in my analogy. This triangle is the Greek letter delta. It usually stands for change in. So delta H literally means change in heat. So if I heat this, that means I'm going to add heat to it. So delta H on the reactant side. How will that shift the equilibrium? Well, to help to, to determine this, decide whether energy is required or released. Well, we've already decided it's required when evaporation occurs. If energy is required, we place the symbol for delta H on the left side, which we, which we did. If energy is released, of course, we're going to put it on the other side. Now, just a reminder from the previous page, evaporation requires energy. Do you remember that from the previous video from the surroundings? Thus, it is an endo thermic process. And delta H, for this example, should be placed on the left side. Now consider Le Chatier's principle. Will the equilibrium shift towards the heat or away from the heat when the system's heated? Now think about the little girl. Which way is she going to go when she gets really, really warm? Is she going to go towards the heat or is she going to go away from the heat? That's right. She would shift away. So, if we're going to shift in this reaction right here, away from the heat, let's use a different color again, we would shift away from the heat and go in this direction, which means we would form more gas. So we say this equilibrium, in this case, is shifting to the right. And the liquid would turn into a gas. So the equilibrium would shift, and at the new equilibrium, at our new higher temperature, we would have more gas, more molecules in the gas phase than we did at the lower temperature. Okay? All right. Let's consider this equilibrium. Let's say we have solid water turn into liquid water. How can we shift this equilibrium to the right? Well, think about this. Is it exothermic or is it endothermic? Solid to a liquid. That means we're melting it. Yeah, that's endothermic again. So we're going to put delta H on the left-hand side. So how can we shift that to the right again? Yeah, if we heat this, the equilibrium is going to be pushed to the right and we are going to make more liquid. And that makes sense. If we have a system at equilibrium, we have solid water, or a solid, and we heat it, we'll cause it to melt. We'll shift the equilibrium, in this case, to the right, because the liquid, the melted phase, is on the right-hand side. Well, let's try a different stress. What if I added pressure to this? It turns out that solid water has a greater volume than liquid water. 
which is very unusual. For all intents and purposes, it's the only substance whose solid has a greater volume than its liquid. So, if pressure is applied, the water will shift to relieve the stress by going to a smaller volume. If you add pressure, you're not going to want to get bigger. You're going to want to go to the smaller volume. So, what has the smaller volume? Let's read this again. Solid water has the greater volume. So the smaller volume would be the liquid, wouldn't it? So this means the equilibrium will shift to the right because that's where the liquid phase is and liquid water will form. So think about ice skating, if you could, for a second. Here's my skate blade. Does that look like an ice skate to you? Sort of, kind of, like one? All right, we have an ice skater applying pressure. Now, here's some ice underneath it. At least we'll make that blue. How does that sound? And so that is solid water, right? Now, when the ice skater applies pressure on that tiny little blade right there, pressure's increasing. Now, it turns out that water has a bigger volume when it's a solid. So, when pressure's applied, Underneath the surface of that skate blade, my water solid will be turning into water liquid to relieve the stress, even though the temperature might be below zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so there's an introduction to Le Chatelier's principle and stress is placed upon a system. We're going to talk lots more about this later. So that's good enough for today's video. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.